Hi, everybody. Okay, so today we're going to talk about experimental design and ethics, section 1.4 of the text. Okay, first of all, an experiment. Uh, let's see. So we have these questions. Does aspirin reduce the risk of heart attack? Is one brand of fertilizer more effective or at growing roses than other? Is fatigue a day as dangerous as drive for, uh, to, let's see, as dangerous to a driver as the influence of alcohol? Questions like these are answered using randomized experiments or observational studies. We will look at important aspects of experimental design. Proper study design ensures the production of reliable, reproducible, and accurate data. All right. So, experiments and variables. The purpose of an experiment is to investigate the relationship between two variables. When one variable causes change in another, we call the first variable the explanatory variable let's see well, that's not a good color let's go with green here darker green explanatory variable the affected variable is called the response variable so uh, so basically we want to understand things and we want to control things uh, we want to uh, uh, mitigate to the extent, to, to, to the greatest extent possible, the, um, the random effects of the world upon us. And so we want to control and understand uh, how things work, and experiments do these. Um, and at bottom, it, it's all about um, trying to uh, control something. Uh, we want to control for the uh, risk of uh, heart disease. We want to uh, control for the risk of a car crash. And uh, the way we can't begin to control that until we understand how it relates to other variables that are more within our control. And so trying to get that relationship between variables which are in our control and those that are not uh, is very important. And once we have that, we can in an informed way control the variables that we are able to control and see the desired response in the response variable and that's what that's that's largely what experiment what what what, what this uh, whole scientific enterprise these days is all about all right in a randomized experiment the researcher manipulates values of the explanatory variable and measures the resulting change in the response variable. Again, we're trying to understand the relationship so that we can exploit it to our benefit. The different values of the explanatory variable, the different values of the explanatory variable are called treatment. An experimental unit is okay so this is a definition here an experimental unit is a single object or individual to be okay great um okay all right here's an example vitamin e a researcher suspects suspects that taking vitamin e makes one less susceptible to disease they compare the health of those who do not those who do and do not take vitamin E, they conclude that um, taking vitamin E, uh, that those who take vitamin E have better health. Does this show that vitamin E prevents disease? And the answer to that is, is no. No, it doesn't show that. Uh, though that might... The, um, it doesn't show that, and the reason is... What do you think? Well, perhaps if somebody is naturally themselves inclined to take vitamin E, they are naturally themselves inclined to do other things that prevent uh, disease. And so is it really because of the actual substance vitamin E being taken into their body that they don't have that disease or that they enjoy a, a generally better health? Uh, not necessarily. Okay, 
uh, additional variables that could cloud a study are called lurking variables. And remember, variables are ways of describing the subject. So one lurking variable in the previous example is the their their penchant for um, for for what for healthy living. So somebody who takes vitamin E could have a higher penchant for um, a stronger penchant for um, a healthy living than somebody who does not. And that might be a better way of explaining the difference or the, the, the susceptibility to disease than vitamin E does. So there's a lurking variable there, a lurking condition, uh, a, a particular condition in the um, subjects that explains the response variable better than our proposed explanatory variable. All right, in order to prove that the explanatory variable is, in fact, causing a change in the response variable, it is necessary to isolate the explanatory variable and um, make sure that all the other lurking variables are more or less the same between, um, between treatment groups. Okay, the, let's see. The researcher must design her experiment in such a way that there is only one difference between groups being compared, the planned treatments. That's it. Okay. This is accomplished by the randomized assignment. So we try and do random um, because in a, in a random sampling or in a random uh, assignment, each person is equally likely to be in either group. And so we would expect, if the sample is sufficiently large, which doesn't necessarily have to be too large, but we'd expect that in such a sample, those that um, are in, those with a particular um, amount, let's say, of that lurking variable are evenly represented between the two groups because each person has an equal chance of being in either group. And so, and so that's just the best that we can do to try and spread. The lurking variables are spread equally among the groups. All right, at this point, the only difference between groups is, what, is the one imposed by the researcher. Different outcomes measured in the response variable, therefore, must be a direct result of the different treatments because everything else, all the things are, 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 are supposed to be equal. In this way, an experiment can provide, provide a cause and effect connection between the explanatory and response variables. Okay, let's talk about the different treatments can be done. When participation, when participation in the study uh, prompts a physical response from a participant, it is difficult to isolate the effects of the explanatory variable. Right, because it could, it could depend on other things within the treatment. To counter the power of suggestion that's at play here, this is the, the power of suggestion is sort of this phenomenon where um, if you tell somebody this will cure them, and they believe you, then the body may just cure itself in a way. So, so, because, the, yeah, and that's sort of the power of suggestion. So to counter the power of suggestion, research, researchers set aside a group, a treatment group, as a control group. This group is given A, this is the control group, a lot of you probably already know this, placebo which is uh, Latin for, uh, I want to please, if I'm not mistaken. A treatment, a treatment that cannot um, influence, okay, so, so, so this is a treatment that cannot influence the response variable. Uh, the control group, because it's made out of inert substances, just uh, usually a sugar pill, which has no difference, no no effect on the uh, on the uh, on the participant 
At least that's the that's the hope. The control group helps the helps researcher balance the effect of being in an experiment with the effect of the active treatment. So sometimes being in an experiment to treat, um, you know, to treat uh, stomach discomfort may be enough to have somebody's stomach discomfort uh, improve. Um, okay. So, but if everybody believes they're in a treatment, they're, 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 they're in an experiment given the same thing, then, then, then that, that all washes out. It's all the same. Okay, of course, if you are participating... Oh, and uh, here's a very interesting study, um, uh, considered, I think, a landmark study in uh, the study of, um, of uh, the effect of, of, of placebos, it's sort of related to... Um, uh, psychosomatic, um, psychosomatic, um, conditions is, uh, is this study right here by Stuart Wolf, uh, in it, and we'll talk about more of that in class. Okay. Um, of course, if you are participating in a study and you know that you are receiving a pill which contains no actual medication, then the power of suggestion is no longer really a factor. Um, and so... We use a blind, a um, a blind study, blinded, anyway, blinded study, in a randomized experiment preserving the power of suggestion. So this is what happens when a person involved in a research study is blinded. He does not know. He does not know who is receiving the active treatment and who is receiving the placebo treatment, as in they don't know whether they are, whether they get it or not. Um, the placebo and the treatment look exactly the same. All right, a double-blind experiment. is one in which both the subjects and the researchers involved with the subject are blinded. So e even the researchers can be tainted by knowing who has the treatment or not. They may look for things that aren't necessarily there. They're, they're, they're highly invested, usually, in their research going a certain way, and so, and so they, they could look and see things that aren't there. So we blind them as well. Okay, just a few more terms that aren't in the book. A blank, in a blank, we apply some treatment and then proceed to observe. Okay, so this is what we call an experiment. And, or experimental study, both, it's a study as well. Experimental study, I'll just put experimental study. Uh, in which we apply, okay, where is it? We apply some treatment and then proceed to observe its effect on the individual. The individual in the experiments are called experimental units, uh, and they're often, or, or they're often called the subjects when they are people. All right. In an blank, well, this is observational study. Observational study. In an observational study, we observe and measure specific characteristics but we do not attempt to modify the individuals being studied. And so in many cases, measuring affects or modifies the individuals being studied. Um, observational studies are very, uh, are very um, uh, hands-off. So, um, and, and so an example of something that is not an observational study is uh, somebody, uh, you know, randomly selects uh, some people on a particular listing and he has their numbers and uh, he calls them up and he says, I'm, 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 I'm doing an observational study here. I'm just going to ask you about your weight once a month. Okay, maybe that seems harmless, right? But um, because the participant knows that their weight is going to be, you know, kind of a, is going to be asked for, they might, um, 
I don't know, they might, they might do something that might affect them. Oh, I need to seem, you know, I need to work out or whatever. I need to lose weight because this person's going to be asking my weight. So, so, um, so that could have an effect. They might become a little bit more weight conscious, especially if they're, if they already knew they had to lose weight and that, that might just be something that helps them to lose weight, which is modifying, which is not an observational study. Okay. That's an experiment. All right. A few more terms not in the book. Okay, so a blank, uh, in a blank, data are observed, measured, and collected at one point. Okay, so this is at, uh, at one point, not over a period of time. So this right here is called a cross-sectional study. Cross-sectional. Just take one point in time when things are studied. Cross-sectional study. This is... Uh, I seem to be missing a slide here. Where did I want to put it? Oh, right, right, okay. Um, all right, it's a cross-sectional study. Uh, data is observed, measured, and collected at uh, one point in time, not over a period of time. All right, and then there's what's called a um, a blank or case controlled study or data collected from the past. So this is called a retrospective study. Retro, from the past. Retrospective. So it uses data from the past. You're basically a, a, a historian, and you're, you're, you're inferring things based on historical data, which might not be all that long ago. Past period, going back in time. All right. Um... There's also something called a prospective study. And this is a, uh, a long-term or longitudinal co cohort study. Um, these are, uh, uh, are data collected in the future from groups that share common factors. Uh, such groups are called cohorts. So one prospective study that I remember uh, is one that was mentioned in uh, in uh, General Conference, the General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which happens every six months. One of the apostles, Elder Uchtdorf, um, gave a famous talk about patience in which he talked about this study where three, or four, three to four-year-old kids were given a marshmallow and they said, if you can just wait 15 minutes, you will get a second marshmallow. Um, that first it started off as, I think it started off as a cross-sectional study, something that just looked at uh, one point in time. But it was interesting because they kept track of the kids who were able to wait and they found later on, it now becomes a longitud longitudinal study, they found that later on, um, those that were able to wait, um, I don't know, experienced better life choices uh, to some degree. Uh, to some significant degree, I guess. And uh, so, so that's an idea of this longitudinal study. They, there was a cohort of uh, young people uh, who were in this initial experiment, and then they followed them throughout uh, a, uh, uh, a good portion of their life and were able to conclude, you know, and, and, and learned a lot more. Okay, perspective. So that's a perspective study. All right. Um, okay. Well, I uh, I didn't update this uh, slideshow early enough. I'm just going to include. So th these are different types of. Um, so there's different types of studies. There's an experiment. There's an observational study. Now within the uh, experiment, w within the class of experiments, there's something called a matched pair. Matched pair experiment. It's a type of experiment where you where you have these subjects and um, and they are uh, the the treatment group and the control group are matched in some way and so this comes in two common forms there's a before and after before and after type of a form. And this is just one example of the way that they could be paired. It could be the same exact person 
and um, and they're tested before, right? And then they do the experimental treatment, and then they're tested after. It's the same group of people, but the before is the treatment group. Sorry, the control group, and the after is the treatment group. So before is control, after is treatment. All right, but there's another, there's also these twin studies, twins, uh, and that is um, the control group are one of the twins and the uh, treatment group is the other of the twins. They are matched because you have somebody in the uh, treatment group and somebody in the... Um, control group that share genetic material they're 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 very very similar to each other and um and so that's that's a, a matched pair experiment okay great all right now let's talk a little bit about ethics we are nearly done here three more slides okay so ethics the widespread misuse of mis of misrepresentation of statistics of statistical information often gives the field a bad name. Some say that numbers don't lie, but the people who use, uh, who use numbers to support their claims uh, can and often do. And here's an example. Um, a guy by the name of Diedrich Staple, a recent investigation of famous social psychologist Diedrich Staple, uh, has led to the retraction of his articles um, from some of the world's top journals including and then a whole bunch of uh social psychology journals and social psychology is such to me it just seems like such a difficult such a difficult difficult area of study and i think the people that do, go, go into it don't don't respect it uh the difficulty as much as i do and they maybe oversimplify things i don't know but i think a lot of social psychologists have been given a bad Oh, kind of a bad rap, but but I think that their field is just so so difficult to get any sort of um, uh, any sort of good information from um, experimentally. Okay, so Diedrich Staple is a former professor of Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Over the past two years, an extensive investigation involving three universities where Staple has worked concluded that the, fi that, the that the psychologist is guilty of fraud on a colossal scale, falsifying data from over 55 papers he authored and 10 PhD dissertations that he supervised. What a mess. What a mess. Okay. Anyway, so don't think it doesn't happen. Uh... There it is. All right. IRB. When a statistical study uses human participants as, the, as in medical studies, both ethics and law dictate that researchers should be mindful of the safety of their research subjects. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services oversees federal invest, uh, regulations of research studies with the aim of protecting participants. When a university or other research institution engages in research, it must ensure the safety of all human subjects. For this reason, research institutions establish oversight committees known as institutional... Oh, gosh. What's the R? Institutional um, b review board. All right. Institutional review board. All right. Uh, many of my colleagues who've done research had to uh, engage with an institutional review board. I, I, as an applied mathematician, did not because I didn't, I didn't do any research with human subjects. Um, but uh, pretty much anybody in the psychology uh, department would have had to have, you know, filed some sort of proposal to the IRB. Uh, but not me. All right. Informed consent. All planned studies must be approved in advance by the IRB. Key protections that are mandated by law include the following. Risk to participants must be minimized and reasonable with respect to proje projected benefits. Participants must give informed consent. Okay. 
or at least their parents must. So when I was at the University of Arizona, that's a very active research institution, um, my kids had the opportunity to participate in a number of studies. And uh, yeah, and they always, they always gave me the, the rundown of, uh, of, of, of what the uh, effect would be. And it was always very, uh, it was always very, there was like no risk in the experiments that they went to. It was all psychological uh, sort of, uh, sort of experiments. Okay. Um, where are we? Data collected from individuals must be guarded carefully to protect privacy. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Privacy is important. Okay. Uh, all right. There it is. Uh, good luck on the quiz and the homework.